to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the word of god says a little leaven leavens the whole lump 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 6. We welcome you to our study of chapters 5 and 6 in the book of 1 Corinthians. Today's lesson is going to be addressing Paul's thoughts or God's thoughts on the subjects of immorality in the church and should Christians take out civil lawsuits against one another. Both very practical and relevant topics for our day today as well. And so we want to invite you to get your Bible handy, have it ready, as we're going to look to the Word of God on these issues. Friend, we're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. Uh, we want to let you know that today's broadcast is being brought to you by members and congregations of the Churches of Christ. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, whether that be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday. They'd be happy for you to stop in and get to know them, learn more about the church itself. And if you've got a question or something you're wondering about, I'm sure they'd be glad to sit down and discuss the Scriptures with you. Friend, we also would like to help you in your journey to know God's Word better here at the Gospel of Christ. One of the ways that we can do that outside of our broadcast is through our website. Please check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, we have a wide variety of good Bible study tools that are available. We have video lessons, audio lessons, transcripts, study questions, just a wide variety of good study material. All of those are available free. You can access them 24-7 from our website. If you'd like to have a copy of that for your own keeping, you can download it from the website or you can fill out a media request form and we'll be happy to send that to you free of charge. And friend, as with going to uh, the church as well in your area, if you've got a Bible study question that we could help you with, Please don't hesitate to write, and we'll try to respond in a timely manner as well. Today we're thinking about some very serious moral problems that the church was facing in the first century and that Christians and the church may have to face today as well. And that problem is this. There was a, a well-known case of immorality, gross immorality in the church and it needed to be addressed. Notice what the Bible says about this problem in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1. The scripture says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. Can you imagine what it must have been like in the church in Corinth to, to see this son here and he's got his father's wife as his wife now. He's taken her and he's living in immorality with her. Friend, not only was that a, a big surprise, no doubt, and shock to some people, but according to the Old Testament, that would have been incest. Leviticus 18.8 Leviticus chapter 20, verse 11, Deuteronomy 22, verse 30, one was not to lie with his father's wife. And so this was contrary to what the Scriptures taught on that subject in the Old Testament. And friend, no doubt, contrary to the teaching of the New Testament. For this reason, Jesus said in Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. God wants that marriage to last till death do us part. Romans 7 verses 1 through 4. And no doubt this man is living in fornication and immorality. Matthew chapter 5 verses 31 and 32. And so he's living in sexual morality. That is when the Bible says he has, meaning that he's in a sexual relationship 
with this woman which is contrary to the teaching of the Bible. And so the immorality that's going on here was a big part of the problem, but also a big part of the problem is these Corinthian Christians are not responding to this immorality properly. Instead of dealing with it and addressing it and saying what the Bible says on this issue, it's as though they think they're bigger or they can tolerate this issue. Notice what the scripture says. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse number 2, Paul says, And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you. When we talk about them being puffed up, we don't know all the details of that. Some would say they're puffed up because they think they can tolerate that in the church. Others would say they're puffed up because they think this sin won't affect their relationship and their worship with God. And the problem is, Paul said, you've, you've taken this wrong. You're looking at this wrong. Instead of being proud and prideful, you should have been mourning. You know, one of the great problems in the days of Jeremiah the prophet that we find in Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, is that the, the, the people had lost their ability to be ashamed and to mourn over sin. They should have in kindness and in love, put this ungodly man in this situation out of the church, meaning address the issue out of love, been heartbroke that it happened, but let people know this is not something that we tolerate, that we think is right, and we cannot stand for these type of things in the Lord's church. The application is very simple from this. Friend, we, we can't just allow and by we I mean God's church the teaching of the scriptures Christians can't just allow someone to live in adultery and overlook it and say well you know what that's their problem God will take care of that no this seems in some ways to be what might have been going on in Corinth when they're puffed up over that. And so maybe they're saying to themselves, well, we know it's right, not right. It really makes us uncomfortable. But hey, they're the ones doing that. God will take care of that. Friend, in the New Testament church, the Bible teaches, as is seen in 1 Corinthians 5, 2 Thessalonians 3, Romans 16, verse 17 following, elders and leaders and Christians who stand for what's right must take charge and disfellowship those who are living immorally. Now, friend, when we say disfellowship, please understand this. The Bible is going to address this subject very clearly and candidly in this chapter, but I want you to know from the outset, this is done in love, and this is done to save souls. This is done because we care about the individual, not because we're mad at them, not because we're trying to be mean, not but no. We're doing this because it's what God says must be done to save their soul from being lost. In fact, the Bible makes it clear. It's an imperative that Christians have to make judgments on matters of morals and doctrine and stand behind those. How do we know that? Look at verse number 3 of 1 Corinthians 5. Paul says, For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has done this thing. Is it wrong for a Christian to make a, a moral or a doctrinal judgment? No. Paul said, I've already judged. This is wrong, and I've already judged it. Well, how did Paul judge? Friend, we judge the right way, by the Word of God. John 7, verse 24, Jesus commanded, judge with a righteous judgment. How do you judge with a righteous judgment? By using God's Word as the standard. Psalm 119, verse 160, all God's commandments are righteous, and we're going to be judged by the Word of God on the final day. We don't want hypocritical judgment where people are standing there, as Jesus said in Matthew 7, with a beam coming out of their eye, and they want to say to somebody else, let me get the splinter out of yours. Jesus said, don't judge like that. But are we commanded to make righteous judgment? Sure. If something's morally against the Scripture teaching, if it's doctrinally wrong, if it's immoral behavior, Christians should and must stand up in love against those type of things. And friend, part of that standing up is Christians must disfellowship 
those who are involved in immorality if they won't repent and stop doing that. Look, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I want you to see what the Bible teaches in verse 4 and 5. What does Paul say to do about this situation? In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen now, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Friend, we cannot tolerate sin. Instead, by Christ's authority, Colossians 3, 17, by speaking the truth in love, Ephesians 4, verse 15, we must deliver such a one to Satan. What's that mean? Purge out the old leaven, Paul will say. Withdraw fellowship. Don't even eat with such a person. What, what is Paul saying here? Are we to say, are we to hate them? Are we to act unkind to them? Are we to be, no. Don't treat him as an enemy. Admonish him as a brother. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6 following. But friend, let it be clearly heard that the Bible teaches by Christ's power and authority, we must withdraw from Every brother who is living disorderly and ungodly to keep the church as pure and as good as God wants it to be. Now, the proper action that Paul describes here against this immoral behavior that is ongoing and unrepented of is that one must withdraw from such a person and not allow that to be in the church of God. How do we know that? I want you to see, again, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. Verse 7 and verse 11 with me. Look at these verses. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Verse 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Verse 11. But now I've written to you, not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, covetous, an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. What's Paul telling us to do here? Friend, there has to be, you've heard it said before, you've got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything, right? Christians have to draw that proverbial land, line in the sand and realize this is wrong. We're not going to stand for that. This can't be tolerated. 1 Timothy 1 verse 20, Paul said, Hymenaeus and Alexander, I delivered to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Ephesians 5 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, expose them. And friend, in 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 14, to people who are guilty of being lazy and not working as they ought to, withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, the Bible would say. Now, please hear this as well. The purpose of withdrawal fellowship or disfellowship is really threefold. It is to take a stand against sin. Paul says, you're puffed up. You shouldn't have done that. You should have taken a stand against that and not tolerated. And so it is to take a stand against what's wrong. But friend, hear this most importantly. It's to save people's souls. Notice verse number 5 again. I don't want you to miss this. Paul says, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Someone says, This fellowship, that's so hard and unkind and I don't think a Christian could ever do that. Friend, if God says it's necessary to save people, how could a Christian be loving and not do that? That's what the Bible teaches. It is a means of saving people who are so steeped in sin that they won't change their lives and repent. And friend, guess what? It works. How do we know that? It worked on this man. We get an update on this exact scenario and, what, and the church following through with it. And I want you to see what is said about how they did this and what happened. This fellowship works. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verses 5 through 11. Paul is now in his second letter addressing this, and he says, If anyone's caused grief, he's not grieved me, but all of you to some extent not to be too severe. This punishment, the punishment Paul described in 1 Corinthians 5, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man. What man? The man who's got his father's wife. 
And so they, they inflicted some kind of punishment on him. He said, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. Well, what happened in this situation? They stood up against it. They withdrew from him. He realized the importance of being right with God in the church. And now Paul's saying, hey, you did what was right. He did what was right. Let him know you love him. Let him know you're proud of him. Let him know that that's what God requires and that he's done that and that he's in full fellowship with God and with the church. Now, friend, another reason that Paul uh, describes disfellowship as important to the church is so that the rest of the congregation can be salvaged and not affected by immorality. Now, you say, okay, what do you mean by that? Look in 1 Corinthians 5, and let's use the illustration that we find in this chapter. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Leavening, uh, an, an agent that will make yeast and things rise, has germs in it, and if that gets in a ball of yeast, before you know it, the whole thing's gone, right? Uh, you've heard the bad apple ruins the whole bushel. Kind of the idea. Paul is saying to keep the church pure, which is what God wants, Ephesians 5, 21 through 31. Pure, unspotted, we've got to put out that which is sinful and that which can infect the whole congregation. Think about this with me. Let's say the church in Corinth tolerates uh, this immorality. What about when an idolater comes along and wants to be an idolater and a Christian? What about when someone who's involved in reveling comes wrong and wants to be involved in uh, reveling, partying and alcohol and Christianity, drunkenness and Christianity? How can you say to the idolater and to the drunkard, you can't do that, but to the man living in immorality, you can? That sets a standard and it's not a good one to set. So Christians, the Bible teaches, should not cho choose, willingly choose, to have close associations with fornicators and immoral people, rather we ought to bring other Christians in as our closest friends. Look at 1 Corinthians 5 verses 9 and 10. Paul says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, yet I certainly did not mean the sexually immoral people of this world, or with covetous, extortioners, idolaters. Since then, you would have need to go out. And so Paul is saying, you've got to withdraw from this brother. And he says, I'm not telling you to go hang around with people like that in the world. That's liable to affect us as well. Remember 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. Evil companions corrupts good morals. All right, let's switch gears then and talk about a, another very practical and relevant situation. This seems to be going on in Corinth, and in Corinth, and in that day and age, it was a pretty big thing to sue somebody, and they didn't think about that a whole lot then. And it's popular today. Should a Christian take out a civil lawsuit against another Christian? Please understand, we're not addressing criminal issues, and that's not what's being discussed in 1 Corinthians 6. The law can deal with that, and they will, and that's their right. But I'm talking about one Christian suing another Christian over civil matters. Should that occur? Well, let's see for ourselves. Open your Bible to 1 Corinthians 6 and notice what Paul says beginning in verse number 1. Paul says, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you've got judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, no, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Paul says, it's, now therefore it's an already, already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourself be cheated? What's Paul getting at here? 
Why in the world would Christians drag each other's mud name and the church's name through the mud and go before a, a worldly, human, heathen, sometimes ungodly court and do that to each other? That's contrary to what this ought to be. It presents a bad testimony for the Lord. We ought to be. Matthew 5, 16 says, Christians ought to be a shining light. Let your light so shine before men that they may exalt, uh, exalt, see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Two Christians whose names are both in the newspaper suing each other in circuit court. Is that really the example that Jesus teaches in Matthew 5, 16? He then will say the congregation has failed to live up to its full position in Christ if this is what's happening. And Paul kind of draws it all to a close by saying, why in the world can't you settle it yourselves, some wise brother among you? And, and uh, if you go to court and go before these human courts and drag your name and the church's name through the mud, he says this, it is already an utter failure. What's he saying? You failed utterly as a Christian and as the church in that community if those are the things we're taking part in. Someone says, well, what if we can't settle it? What if that good brother who meets us in the middle and we talk to each other and we still can't work it out? Why would you not rather suffer wrong and be cheated than to over a few dollars drag the Christian name, influence, and the church of the Lord through the muck and the mire of a heathen court? Do we really think that's the best approach Paul is saying? And so the advice Paul gives here is that we need to realize Christians ought not to be suing one another. Christians, on civil matters, we ought to be able to work it out ourselves. If both are acting like a Christian, then, friend, we ought to be able to come together and work it out. If we can't work it out, find a good brother who can sit down with both of them and work it out. If that can't be worked out, then don't, don't ruin the Christian influence. Take the wrong. Take the cheating if you must. But don't drag the church and the Christian influence and all that goes with that through the mud, Paul will say, in this context. And so Paul mentions that as Christians, we can't get caught up in all this immorality and what's popular today, the suing one another and all the immoral things that are going on. Rather, we've got to stay above all that sin and all that that's going on. What do you mean? Look in 1 Corinthians 6, and I want you to see what Paul says to Christians in verses 9 and 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be tricked, don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Friend, we've got to realize that God expects us uh, to control ourselves. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12, I'll not be brought under the power of any, Paul will say. I've got to control my passions and desires. And if there is a proper way, like with marriage, to use those, then that's fine. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable, the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. But for the rest of this immorality, the Christian's got to, and this is the hard part, Christian's got to say no to himself. I can't do that. That's not right. I'm not going to participate in it. Whether it be suing, whether it be immorality, whatever it may be, we've got to control ourselves. And then, of course, Paul will say, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee sexual immorality. Friend, you can't get involved. You can't live faithfully to the Lord and live in sexual immorality. Why is that? Because your body has been separated for a greater purpose. Did you know that? When you became a Christian, your body was separated for a better purpose. What is that purpose? I want you to look in verses 19 and 20. Paul says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit with your gods. Why must we not get caught up in the sinful actions that are going on in this world and as they relate to our body? Because this old body doesn't belong to me anymore. Do you hear that? The Bible says 
Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, uh, whom you have from God? And listen, and you are not your own. What do you mean I'm not my own? You were bought at a price. Who, the Christian? A price was paid for you to be saved, right? The blood of Jesus on Calvary. You were bought at a price. Oh, okay, what now? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are His. Friend, my life, from the point I become a Christian forward, should be used to the honor and the glory of Almighty God. I don't want to take part in things that are not right. I want to realize it's not about me anymore. This is bigger, more important to me. I mean, I have a higher calling to serve God, not my own foolish and carnal lusts that are actually going to do more harm to me. And so let's realize how important it is to be a Christian, to rise above what other people may be doing, and to live to a higher standard, God's standard. Friend, if you're not a Christian, we sure want to encourage you to be one today. There's no better life than the Christian life. There's no better way than Christ's way. Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you submitted yourself to the will of God? Friend, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. 1 Corinthians or Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. The Bible says God wants all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. And God doesn't want anybody to be lost. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. But the individual has to choose for himself. Joshua 24, verse 15. Would you choose today to be a faithful child of God? Have you heard the message of Jesus Christ, that He's the Savior of the world? Do you believe that? Are you willing to repent of sin, confess His name before men? And would you do what the Bible teaches to become a Christian? The Bible says in Acts 22, 16, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And to those of us who are Christians, followers of Christ, members of the New Testament church, friend, we are encouraged to take a stand against sin, rise above that which is wrong, give our bodies and our lives to God, and do everything we can to honor and magnify His name with our life. May God help us to do just that. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.